Happy Resurrection Day. Yeah. So I just want to take this time right now to welcome you to our church service this morning. Um, a lot of, uh, we see a lot of visitors, so we just want to welcome you at this time and thank you for joining us as we get things ready. We're going to uh, start with some worship and uh, open up in, a, in prayer, but I just wanted to share real quick that um, as we uh, remember Pastor Vince and Alana who are not with us this morning, but I'm sure they're maybe watching us online, um, keep them in your prayers, but uh, we're definitely going to fill in for them as best as we can. Thank the Lord with the Lord's help. Amen. So I'm just going to share real quick a, a, a scripture the Lord gave me this week and, and sharing as we open up in prayer. So uh, it's found in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. And it says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for. The proof of what is not seen. And so that's, I just wanted to share just real quick on, on why we're here, why we're doing this, and why is it such a special day for us as believers and those that believe who Jesus Christ is and what he did, what he came here for. And the word that the scripture just said was the hope. He gives us hope. That's, that's exactly why we wake up each morning, because we have that hope. The hope that he, um, He's going to be there for us uh, throughout our day. He's going to continue to be with us for eternity, the Word says. And I just wanted to share that with you this morning, that in case you're here for the first time listening to um, the Word of God, that it all starts with hope. And that's where faith starts, right? Our faith is something that um, could be as small as a mustard seed. And that's where uh, that seed is planted in each and every one of us. And so as, as things progress in your life, that's where our faith grows. And so I just wanted to say that hope is, is exactly what um, each and every one of us should be asking for because the fact that um, when, the day, when Jesus uh, rose from the dead our hope is that we would be able to spend eternity with him once we leave this earth. Amen. Amen. And so I just wanted to, like I said, share that short bit of, uh, of scripture because I know from this minute on you're going to hear a lot about who Jesus is, what, why he came to earth and why he had to die for our sins and why he rose again on the third day and why he sits and not only sits in heaven but he's he's right here in your heart um, yeah. and you're all going to have that opportunity to receive Jesus before the day ends so if I could just ask all of us to stand as we open up in prayer Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, for this resurrection day, that we could remember you, Lord, that we know that there's so much distraction in the, word, the world right now, Lord, that uh, whether it's the meaning of Easter or, or what comes about this time of year, Lord, we just ask that you will open our hearts, open each one of our hearts, and by faith that we would receive your word that will be given and that your Holy Spirit will help us and guide us through everything that we think of today, Lord. And we know the enemy is going to try to disrupt everything that we're doing, Lord, but greater is he who is in me than he that's in this world, Lord. So I just ask that your blessed Holy Spirit will guide each one of us, those that are leading worship, Lord, that you will bless them, bless their hands, bless their mouth, Lord. Every song that we sing, Lord, that it would bring glory to you, Lord. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we just want to remain standing. The worship team will lead us into worship and praise. Amen. Thank you. So uh, we're going to sing this first song called Child of God. And I just wanted to share something very quickly about it. In John chapter 1, 
It talks about Jesus being the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all that came to be, creatively speaking, came to be through Him. Jesus came to His own later on down in, in that first chapter of John, and I would recommend for everybody to read the book of John in, in entirety, but read that first chapter, and it will give you a really cool insight into who Jesus is. The Bible says that He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him, but to as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe on His name. This song, Child of God, it's a privilege to be called the Child of God. It goes like this.
from Romans 5.11. And not only that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have now received reconciliation. We have a reason to have joy. We can rejoice in this house this morning. Amen. 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 Amen.
three, okay? One, two, three, and then hallelujah, okay, ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah! Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. Praise you. You guys can just see it now. I know you guys were up for a while. <laughs> That's why sometimes I don't snap, my back starts hurting now. But uh, praise Jesus, I I'm glad that it's filled today. Uh, the Spirit of God is here. Um, but I just want to give a quick testimony, then shortly we'll take a, a five minute pause to greet everybody. So, as you know, at the age of 19 years old, that is when I came to the Lord. And um, there was this verse that always impacted me the first time when I came to God. It was John 8, 32. It says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Yeah. So that verse has inspired me so much up until this point in my walk because at 19 years old, I was really lost. And if we've seen nowadays in high school, that's when people start to ask themselves, well, what am I going to do in my life? You know, who's, what, what's my direction? And sometimes, you know, we that are older, we want to tell them, well, do this with your life, do this. But really what we should be telling them is give your life to Jesus. That's where it starts. Yeah. Then they'll find direction, amen? Yeah. So 19 years old, um, for those of you that know, I went through a lot of things, dealt with depression, um, had PTSD, I went through a lot of things. Um, and for five months I was that way, I was really lost, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And I said it one night, okay, and just to let you guys know background about me, I didn't grow up a believer, okay, I didn't grow up praying, no one really taught me that. But this one night I was so lost and broken, so desperate, and I said, Jesus, if you can hear me, I don't know if you're real, I don't even know how to pray. But if you can hear me, please just show up right now. I need you. Please. And then I got in the shower and cried, cried like a little baby. <laughs> but uh, after crying like a little baby, I got out, right, obviously, got dressed, whatever. I got this random nudge in my heart uh, to go in this cabinet. Uh, it's right next to my room, and I opened the cabinet, and guess what was in there? A holy Bible. And to me, that was kind of like God telling me, like, I'm right here, Eli. I'm right here. If you want to know God's phone number, it's Jeremiah 33.3. 3. It says, call to me and I will answer you. That's all I did. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't. And sometimes we complicate it too much. God says he looks at the heart. Right here, he understands you. He understands us. So as he, he, he answered that prayer and I seen the Bible, I obviously didn't just pick it up and understand the whole thing. and oh, oh, oh. I know some, some of you here that's happened. For me, that didn't happen. Okay, I seen the Bible, I'm like, man, here's, whoa, okay. And it kind of freaked me out, actually, that he actually heard me. I was like, wow, you really are real. And so I ended up going to sleep that night. I started sleeping with the Bible next to me, you know, do those little things that we do. And um, I just kept praying. I ended up getting this job out of Castroville in the warehouse. And man, like, he just sent more soldiers of Christ to just keep telling me about Jesus. Like, the more I kept praying and saying, God, show me real, God, God, do you hear me? It was like he just kept sending people, and they started telling me the message of Christ. And if you don't know the message of Christ, really, is that he died. Or else on that cross, for all our sins. And then he rose again, and that's what we're celebrating, church. Can I get an amen? Amen! That's why we're celebrating, yeah. church. Amen. So, it went on, and they just kept telling me about Jesus. I met Pastor Vince. Um, and that's Pastor Vince of Freedom Church. He's out of New Mexico right now. I'm sure he's online. Let's say hello to Pastor Vince real quick. Pastor Vince! Amen. But um, he's out there with his wife. We're enjoying having a little vacation. And so, yeah, a lot of people just kept telling me about God. Met Pastor Vince, gave my life, got baptized. And as Christians, we don't look back. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Somebody get the baby. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> see, see, so I'm glad that just happened because that's symbolic of us. Hey, why are you, Lord, Lord, Lord? Yeah. And that that came and picked up. Praise you. Praise you, Jesus. Praise, you, Jesus. Praise God. So I encourage the church as we celebrate this resurrection Sunday. Praise him. Praise him. Because he's done so much. He's done everything for us. I mean, think about that, that when we leave this earth, eternity with him. How beautiful is that? Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. 
So now uh, we're going to take a, a five minute pause and we'll resume shortly, okay? Thank you, church. Yeah. The high king laid low the fountain of all joy, saying, My soul is so deeply grieved I could die right now. Oh, the dark night before the cross. The air thick with anguish, torment, heartbreak. The kiss of the disciple of betrayal soon to reverberate through the branches of the olive trees that engulfed the garden. God had come to man to bring man to God, and man responded with crucifixion. Feel the weight of the sinfulness of sin, that given the chance, sin would try to kill God himself. That is why only God himself can kill sin. Sin has cost us everything. Only the Savior can afford the bill. Behold the Son of God, perfectly good, perfectly righteous, but now perfectly sorrowful, alone, desperate for the prayers of his friends, but none will be found. O oh Lord and Savior, how heavy was that night before you would die? What could bring the Lord of glory to thrice ask for deliverance from what he was about to endure? Was it the failure? and fickleness of those who followed you? Was it the pending torture of the Roman crucifixion? And perhaps even worse, that the beating, the spitting, the suffocation would be done by those you love? Or was it the hours you would spend taking on the sins of the world under the full weight of the Father's infinitely holy anger? Were you, O oh Lord, bracing yourself for the first moment ever? that you would have to say, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, why have you forsaken me? Behold, the sacred, scandalous garden of Gethsemane, the redemption of the garden of Eden. This is the tale of two Adams. Unlike the fruit that charmed the first Adam, this cup of suffering offered no deceit, no trickery, just straight reality of the cost of redemption. No secrecy, only submission. This is the exchange of the failure of Eden for the faithfulness of Gethsemane. Where Adam fell, Jesus stood strong. Where Adam hid his face from God, Jesus peered into what it would look like for the Father to hide his face from us. In the garden, the serpent leads Adam to a tree resulting in death. In Gethsemane, Jesus crushes the head of the serpent by going to a tree that resulted in life. Oh, dear brother and sister, stand in awe of the sacred, scandalous Garden of Gethsemane. You can give advice now. Um, when I first heard that Thursday, I was like, man, I got to share that with you guys. I got to share that with you guys because that clearly pictures two separate gardens. Two separate atoms, but most importantly, two separate outcomes. You know, the first garden, the garden of Eden, beauty as far as I can see. And the most beautiful thing in that garden was the relationship that God had with man, that the Creator had with His own creation. And a serpent rolled in one day whose only objective was to ruin that relationship. Through deception, through lies, through a tree, thought he had did that. To the average eye, it looked like he had did that. Because when Adam and Eve ate that fruit, a separation did happen from man and God. A separation. To the average eye, it looked like he had done it. Can you turn my mic down a little bit? But there was a promise that was made that day. A promise that through her seed would come one that would crush his head. And although his head would crush his heel, his heel would ultimately crush his head. And then we look at a second garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. <coughs> where the beauty is not easily seen through the suffering 
and anguish of a second hour. Where the beauty is not easily seen or heard through the prayers that were prayed for not only the disciples, but for each and every single one of you. Where the beauty is not easily felt through a kiss of one he loved, of one he taught, a kiss of betrayal. But the beauty of that second garden is that the first garden where man failed and sin caused separation between God and man. At the second garden, that second Adam, Jesus Christ, would bear the weight of sin all the way to the cross and pin it at the cross with himself. And I'm not just talking about sin, but I'm talking about all our sin, the sin of the world. You see, at the cross is where sin meets death. And at the resurrection, death meets itself when life comes alive. When Jesus rose again, why we are here is because of what he did, his death, his burial, and his resurrection have brought his life to us all. So Father God, I come to you humbly to thank you, to thank you for that day at the cross, Father. To the average eye, we don't understand what you are doing, but we thank you. We thank you for bringing us back into relationship with you. We thank you for the resurrection, because through that resurrection, we now have life. Life abundantly, life eternally. So we thank you. Right now, more than ever, just get me out of the way, Father. Have your glory in this room. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Um, let me tell you, when, when I first started putting this together, it, it was kind of hard. I'm going to go over uh, the last 24 hours of Jesus. The last 24 hours, uh, the supper uh, that he enjoyed with his disciples. And I thought, you know, the Lord just gives me words, gives me words. And I thought it would be easy, and it came with some frustration as I watched Friday night. We watched The Passion of the Christ, and I tried to put things together, and I couldn't get it. And I was trying to put a powerful sermon together for you all. And, and the Lord showed me, he goes, you don't need to put a powerful sermon. We always serve a powerful God. And he's got to show what he can do. It's so all that matters. All that matters is that his glory fills this room. And I want us to understand that because Moses, we're going to learn a little bit about today, he asked God for one thing. You know, a lot of people, when they look at the life of Moses, sometimes, uh, and I'm talking about the brethren, I'm talking about the believers, I'm talking about the uh, scholars, the Bible uh, studiers, I'm talking about all, all of them. When they look at Moses, they look at um, his disobedience, his failure to get in the promised land. And I want to tell you, his disobedience didn't keep him from the promised land. Because... God offered him the promised land. God was so mad that, that the people of Israel were making all these false idols, worshiping these uh, golden calves and all, all, this, uh, all these other gods, that God's promises are all yes and amen. And he told Moses, you guys just go to the promised land. You can have it. You can have your promised land and you can live off the milk and honey. And, and, and I won't bother you, but I can't be there with you because my wrath will be poured out on you guys. His wrath will be poured out on their disobedience. So he said he, they could have it, but he would not go with them. And Moses said, if you're not there, I don't want to be there. If you're not there, I don't want to go home. So it wasn't Moses' disobedience that kept him from the promised land. It's that separation that would be felt by that second Adam, Jesus Christ, from God, that he didn't want to go. You know, I told you, 
Moses asked for one thing. And a lot of us think when we read the Bible, we think, oh, well, Solomon uh, was offered one thing too. And he, he, he got the best thing ever because he, he said wisdom. He asked God for wisdom. And through that wisdom, God gave him others, gave him a long life, gave him riches, gave him everything he needed, honor. But it was that same wisdom that would cause him later to turn to God. See, Moses asked for one thing. He asked if he could just see the glory of God. One thing. If he could just see the glory of God. And God, I don't know not which, but he it came with some understanding. He goes, you cannot see my face. He says, I will put you on a rock and I will cover you. And let me tell you how good it is to be covered by God's hand. He said, I will cover you. And as I pass by, you can see the tail end of my glory. I said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see the face of God. The poor in spirit shall, shall see God's glory. You know what God's glory is? I'm up there on the cross with everyone's sin that gets nailed to it, with every next believer that comes, that's God's glory. That's why the angels rejoice in heaven, for every new believer we get. So I want to go over, um, oh, I got to in here somewhere. The book of Luke, chapter 22. It's gonna be the Last Supper. If you guys got your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm actually going to start on verse 7, Luke 22, 7. And like I said, this is um, it's going to be the beginning of Jesus in the last 24 hours. And I want, to, I want us to really get a clear understanding of why we celebrate today. Then on the day of unleavened, of unleavened bread came when the Passover of the Lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat Passover. So for many of us that already know and for those that don't know, Passover was a, a time of Moses. You know, Moses, the people of Egypt, God's people, were in bondage, just like many of us. See, they were in bondage to Egypt, but we were in bondage to our sin. And they were crying out to God, how Eli demonstrated, how the little baby demonstrated earlier, they are crying out to God to be rescued, to be delivered from that bondage. So God sent Moses. Moses went up to Pharaoh, who was like the king at that, or not like was, the king of Egypt, and would ask them, let my people go. Of course, Pharaoh and Dr. Gong just let anyone go. So he's like, no. So God started releasing some plagues along the land of Egypt. And as the plagues kept getting worse and worse, Moses would go back and say, let my people go. Let my people go. God would harden uh, Pharaoh's heart. And again, he would be like, get out of here. No, you're not going to go. And then one last plague that he uh, sent was going to be a plague that would take everyone in the land's firstborn kid. And God tells Moses to tell the people of Israel to go find a lamb and sacrifice it. To sacrifice it, put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their house. They were to eat that lamb and then go eat that lamb before a certain time and then have nothing else to do with the lamb. If they had any leftovers, they were to burn it in the morning. And then that night when it hit, as the plague would come over, some many call it the angel of death would come over, it would go from house to house, hut to hut, tent to tent, whatever it may have been, taking the firstborn of that household. And when it would come to a house, that was covered in the blood of that lamp, it would go over it and pass over it and go to the next house. 
So that's why it was so crucial to have the blood of the lamb on that house for the people of Israel because it would go house to house, pass over the house of the blood of the lamb, and go to the next one. And so we find that the tradition stood along as the people were delivered from Egypt as many years go, go by, maybe about a thousand years at this time. I don't, you know, I'm not a scholar, I don't know how long it was, but they were still celebrating the deliverance of Egypt. And so they would have Passover festivals, and they would sacrifice a lamb in remembrance, and they would take all the unleavened, all the le leaven out of the house and eat unleavened bread, because that night they didn't have time to cook a full loaf of bread. So they had to kind of do things quick. So that's what Passover basically is. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. Listen, he said to them, when you, when you enter the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters. Tell the owners of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I can eat Passover dinner with my disciples? The teacher being Jesus, of course. The man, then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs. Make preparations there so that they would, so they went, found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. So they had to get there quick. Uh, tradition says that everything had to be prepared before uh, the next day, which would be 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's how their days ran, and I want us to get this. So, so they would go over there. They needed to find and prepare everything because in the nighttime is when the angel of death passed over the Israel people. And the ones that had the blood, the lamb of the, the blood of the lamb covered on their doorpost. So they had to do it at a certain time. And Jesus is sending them out, and the first thing he says, because they asked them, like, where, where are we gonna have it? He's like, go get ready, get ready for dinner for us. Go get ready. We're gonna have a feast, go, go get everything prepared. And he's like, where do we go? And he's like, go into the city, you'll find a man carrying a jug of water. And I want us to get this first point right here because. A man carrying a jug of water, it wasn't really the man's job to do that. It was something that in the Bible where we find women doing, just like we find the woman at the well. We find different women. When, when the angels came to Abraham, it was, it was it, the wife or the woman that carried the water and offered the water. So this was kind of odd and, and that a man would be carrying a jug of water. But let me tell you, when Jesus tells you to do something, what should you do? You should listen. You should listen and go do it. Because even though it sounds crazy, you got to trust Jesus. Uh, I once heard this, uh, this lady, this pastor, she said uh, she was on her way to church. And before she was leaving, the Lord told her to put some leotards on under her dress. And she really couldn't comprehend why she would do that. But she listened. She's faithful. And as she was on church and she was uh, getting the worship team ready and she was preaching a little bit, as she uh, left the uh, stage, the Lord told her to do a cartwheel. <laughs> and she did a cartwheel on the way off the stage. Great sermon, great church, she said at the end when everyone's leaving, she noticed that there was one guy that was stood behind, head down in tears. So she went over there to try to go see what's wrong. And as she started talking to him and asking him what's wrong, he said that I was on the verge of giving up. I told God, if you're real, I, I told him to do the most craziest thing. I said, if you're real, someone at church would do a flip. <laughs> and you did a cartwheel. It's crazy. I hear it all the time, different stories like this. It's obedience to God. So there, when God says there's a man carrying a water jug, these disciples didn't question it. They're like, okay, let's go into the city. Let's see. There's a man carrying a water jug. He's going to show us where we're going to have dinner. They're obedient to what Jesus called them to do. 
When the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have favorably desired to eat this Passover dinner with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it amongst yourself. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them, and said, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. A body that was seen to be broken. Not a bone but a body of person. Understand that. And we do this, we know this as communion, and we do it very often in remembrance of what he did that day. I want to skip this, because Passover dinner, remember I said they had to prepare it by six. So technically, and there's some debate on this, technically I believe Passover dinner was in this same 24 hours that Jesus will be crucified. Everything happened that fast. The deception, the betrayal, the arrest, the beating, the crucifixion. So that's why when we break bread with one another, we do it in remembrance of what he did that faithful day. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which will be poured out for you. And I want us to understand that because it's a new covenant. God is so one-sided. He took it all on himself. See, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of baptisms that are happening today. There's a lot of different traditions that are happening today. It don't matter what you're doing if you don't have Jesus. Jesus is the only way to the Father. It's the new covenant, one-sided, no matter what we can do, unless we understand that it's all what he did, the finished work at the cross, we'll never get a true comprehension of what we are. But look, the hand of the, the one that betrayed me is at the table, at this table with me, for the Son of Man will go away, and it has been determined, but woe to that man who betrayed me. And that's the kiss that we're talking about. That's the kiss that we're talking about. Judas. And I want us to get this because Jesus is at the table. Jesus knows what's going on, what's going to happen. But yet he still has him. He still has love. He still uh, washes his feet before this even happened. And he knows who's going to do what. You see, G, uh, Judas for a lousy piece of 30 silver is about to sell out Jesus is what we believe. But in reality, Judas is selling out himself. No one saw Jesus. Jesus went willingly, but Jesus, or Judas, is about to sell out himself. See, Judas has this one problem, he, he, he covets things. He covets possessional possessions, money. Um, I once heard Rockefeller say, was asked, how much money is enough? At the time, he was like the richest man, one of the richest men in the world. He said, just a little more. Just a little bit more. The same covet that Adam and Eve had in the garden. God made this beautiful garden of Eden for them where they could have anything except that one thing. And when the serpent came in, deceived them, 
made that tree live to have made it live desirable. They started to grow up hunger. Even though they could have anything, they wanted the one thing that they couldn't have. Just like Jesus had it all, but still willing to give it up. So they began to argue amongst themselves. Which of them could it be? Which of them could it be? Who was going to do it? And I want us to get how quickly things change. Because first they go from, it's not me, it's not, it can't be me. And then they start arguing which ones it could be. They start to dispute amongst them about who is considered greatest. They go from, it's not me, it's not me. It can't be me because I'm great. I'm good. And I know this is Peter. This is Peter right here because Peter was the one that always had all the answers. Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? They started answering uh, some believer this prophet, you're that prophet, you're, you're this, or one of the prophets of all. And he asked, who do you think I am to his disciple? Peter said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God, quick to answer. God's like, I can't have been you, Peter, had to been for my father in heaven. That was Peter, had the answer for every single thing, quick to answer. But then he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord over them, and those who have authority over them have themselves called benefactors. It is not to be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you should become like the youngest, and whoever leads like the one serving. So Jesus is telling them right now, Looking at the guy at the uh, door, you know, the guy that should be washing people's feet, he's like, nah, that guy at the door, we're not better than that guy at the door, okay? We're not better just because we're at this table, we're no better than that guy at the door. Matter of fact, Jesus, when he came in, he took the towel and started cleaning his disciples' feet to show them that we are here to serve one another. We're not better than one another. We never were. We're here. God is here. I want us to get that understanding. In the New uh, Testament, it says, but among you, it will be different. Those who are greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be the servant. And there's a key word in there, and it says, but those among you, it will be different. It will be different for those among you. And I want us to understand that because it is different. And that's one of the scariest things coming to Christ, is change. That's one of the main things that keeps somebody from coming to Christ, is change. Because it, it will be different. I'm glad you're here, my brother. Um, when I first came to God, he could see the change in me. He was dealing with trouble, he was dealing with tribulation, and he knew that there was change in me, and he told me, he was like, Nick, it's okay what you're going through. I'm still gonna be here when you come back. Because there was change in me. He wasn't used to it. It was different. It was different, matter of fact, a uh, little bit about my testimony, it's big on Easter. See, my dad, he was in a coma weeks prior to Easter, and on that Friday, that Good Friday, that I didn't know what Good Friday was, they told us that he wouldn't be making My sister broke, and she, like, I, I broke when she broke, I thought I was here to protect her, and I can't do nothing. Uh, long story short, I prayed to a God I didn't know, which I did so often, and he came through. But that night he came through differently because he gave me this feeling like Eli talked about earlier. A feeling that I couldn't understand. A feeling that I thought 
that I was able to deal with death for my dad. So me and my dad never had a great relationship, so I thought this would be easy. When I went back, um, my dad opened his eyes on Easter. On Easter Sunday. See, there was a last resurrected that day, and it wasn't the one that was in the coma. It was the one that prayed toward God that he didn't know. See, the thing I don't tell, people heard that before, the thing I don't tell me is when I went home, I knew something changed. Something was different that I couldn't understand. Couldn't understand on a day that we're supposed to be remembering the God that gave it all up for us. I'm praying to him, asking for help, and I expect him to help me. On a day when he is resurrected, why he would bring my dad back to life when he was supposed to be gone. I didn't understand what he wanted me to do. And as I started going through everything, as I started um, walking the walk out, as the change started happening, it started causing problems in my family. Because we came from a background, of a Catholic background. And now I'm at a Jesus background. And I'm not saying nothing about the Catholic Church. I believe there will be a lot of the Catholic Church that do recognize Jesus as Savior and will be there. So I'm not saying nothing, but there was two different realities there. And as I would invite my wife and talk to my wife about Jesus, we caused more of a separation. And then one day I, I came to God. I actually didn't even tell my wife. I went up to this place in um, uh, Merced, to this church in Merced. I met my mom, my daughter out there. We went there. I remember when we were going through, uh, my mom asked me, she goes, are they going to be speaking in tongues? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's get ready. Um, we went in there. I, I, I thought I was going there for a concert because these guys, they perform a lot. So I thought I was going there for a concert. They did a little service and they did something real interesting that they normally don't do. They did an altar call before they did their performance. And when I came up to the altar, and the only reason I went up there because my mom's like, let's go. She, they're praying over her hands. I guess she has some arthritis or something. I, I don't know, but as I'm there, one guy just prayed over me real quick, smacked me right in the head, and I didn't understand it. Um, but when I left there, I never seen the concert. I went back home. I went back home because I got the word from God that, okay, if you're going to submit, Get ready. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was to come. See, when I went home that day, I, I, I knew there was going to be a fight brewing. I knew it was going to be, I thought this was the final straw between me and my wife. Because we were already hanging on a thread. And I truly believed that maybe God was calling me to walk away. I didn't know. I don't know God's plans. We don't get God's plans. We don't understand God's plan. But it's not for us to understand. It's for us to be obedient. And when I went home, the fight grew and it kept brewing and it got worse. I slept on the couch for many nights. And all of a sudden, as I'm going to this church, my wife asked me, how come you never invite me to the church? Even though I invited her countless times, she asked me, why don't you ever invite me to the church? You know, today is a special day because at another church, another one of my brothers has been to the congregation. He's been here many times. He's actually uh, been at the house church, been here at this church. Uh, they're having a baptism over there. He had five years of praying for one thing. That didn't look like it was going to happen. Same deal. Relationship. Well, today his wife is being baptized. He texted me last week and he told me, you know, what's so powerful is that me, my wife, my daughter, got baptized that same day he, his son, and his daughter did. Amen. We don't understand what God's doing. But it's God's glory that this happens. See, everything you bring to God, when you truly submit, when you truly surrender and you say, here I am, you drop it there at the cross. He pins up your sin, your iniquity, and all that, and leaves it there. Amen. Everything you were, 
everything, all the yuck and garbage, he bundles it up and throws it into this sea of forgetfulness. That's why we can never do anything. That's why we recognize the bread. We recognize the cup. We take that in remembrance of what he did. And that's why I speak to you about the glory of God with all these testimonies because it's the remembrance of what he did and what he can do that keeps it on the cross. That's why when my daughter's here, I let her know that it's the remembrance of what God did for our family because there's going to come a time in her life where she don't know how she's going to get out of it. She don't know how she's going to get through it, but she's going to know Jesus got my family through it and he'll get me through it too. I'm going to end it real quick. Uh, sorry, Phil, can you come up here? Uh, can I, I want to invite you guys all up here. I want us to get a clear understanding of the cross. Because the cross is where, where Jesus took all the punishment that we deserve. He, he took all the punishment that we deserve just to bring us back in relationship with God. The one thing that was lost in that garden was man's relationship. God didn't lose anything. I want us to understand that. God didn't lose anything, but man lost a relationship with God that could only be recovered by the blood that took place on that cross. My sin, my iniquity, my yuck is on that cross so that I may have life. The resurrection is the place where death saw its own founder. Because through the resurrection, we now have eternal life. The sting of death does not hurt no more. You know, Phil said earlier, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, or the word was with God. The Word was God. It goes on to tell us that the Word uh, took human form. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But yet, we didn't recognize Him. Matter of fact, we betrayed Him. We arrested Him. We spit on Him. We tortured Him. We crucified Him. did it for us to bring us back in a relationship with God. Amen. So on that third day, on this Resurrection Sunday, we will all get life. Not only life, but life in abundance.
why we're here today. And he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God.
still be here in the altar if anyone needs prayers or needs anything. We also have a prayer box. If there's something going on today and, and you may be struggling with anything and you want to ask God anything, there's a prayer box right there. Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Drop it in there and, and it will be prayed over. I understand sometimes it's, it's different. Like I talked about coming up to the altar. God just moving right now. We don't really know what to expect. But that prayer box is always open. Amen. One more time. Hallelujah. Ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah!